All right. Good evening. As you know, I'm Dr. Homer Whistlebritches. Oh, wait. Oh, that wasn't right. Sorry. Let's start over. <laughs> uh, just see if you're awake. So I'm Dr. Paul Jackson, the pastor of three Methodist churches out here in, what is this area called? The Huntington Circuit. Yes. And um, we are beginning a study of the book of Revelation. And as our textbook, we're reading Scott McKnight's Revelation for the Rest of Us. How many of you already have a book? Excellent. How many of you are going to get one and still need one? Okay. Now, if, if you want to, you can access this book uh, through Kindle. You can get on Amazon and order that. And I've got, I've got it on my phone. And it's, it's a handy uh, little device. You probably know what that is. I've got a lot of books on my, on my cell phone. So I don't have to take big library with me when I go. Sorry. Now, um, if if you'll look in your book, I want to point point out a couple things. It's going to give you an idea of how we're going to go through this. Um, there are five different parts and 22 chapters so i i figure that we can what are the total pages about 200 and well all the way to the end is about 300 so we'll we can probably cover um i said eight weeks eight into 22 goes what almost well three Eh, that might be three chapters a night might be okay. That'll give you time to study for the midterm and final exams. <laughs> Next week we'll have half this amount. <laughs> um, I want I want you to notice the the table of contents. And it's very interesting because this writer and I are about the same age, and we started. Being becoming interested in the book of Revelation about the same time, and the same kinds of books and fever pitched exploration of the book of Revelation was well underway. The late great planet Earth by Hal Lindsey was popular, you may have even read that. Then later on, we had the Left Behind series, and I've always said about the Left Behind series is the only thing that's been left behind are all the good commentaries. Now, uh, I think you can watch the Left Behind series for entertainment, but not so much as far as really faithful interpretation of the book of Revelation and eschatology and end times or everything that's related to what people associate with the book of Revelation. And you're going to find out that there are some words that do, that do not even show up in the book of Revelation that people talk a lot about. And one of those is the Antichrist. The book of Revelation says nothing about the Antichrist. It only shows up in the letters of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the way that it's used in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, it refers to a group of people or the spirit of Antichrist. So one of the false perceptions and false expectations that people have is that there is going to be this singular person pop up someday, and that is going to be the Antichrist. Now, a better way to think about this is that there has always been a spirit of Antichrist. And it has surfaced in a lot of historical figures. Wouldn't you agree? 
and it is probably in some historical figures right now. But if you read your introduction, you will see that it doesn't take a lot of imagination, and people don't put forth a lot of cerebral activity at all when they start thinking that, oh, Obama must be the Antichrist. I remember having a nephew of mine call me. When, he, when Obama was elected, he calls me and says, Brother Paul, don't, uh, Uncle Paul, don't you think Obama's the Antichrist? I said, no, and I think that you're being a little silly. How about that? Um, <laughs> go eat your Cocoa Krispies or whatever. Uh, I was real nice to him, but I've heard that other times. And then before, it doesn't just have to be a Democrat, but also a Republican. It's, it switches back and forth, and it sometimes is not even an American person. Um, at one time, it was Ronald Wilson Reagan. All his name has six letters in, um, you know, first, middle, and last. Now, the 666 that is in the book of Revelation, but there is a better way of thinking about what that is instead of looking for that etched in someone, the crown of their head. I don't know if you ever saw the movie The Omen. You remember that? Oh, uh, who was in that? Car was it uh, who was a famous actor? Huh? What was that again? Yes, Gregory Peck. Um, and they made several of those. The Omen one, two, and this this kind of thinking emerged from the seventies. Okay, and this dispensational premillennial kind of idea and the book talks about that and i'll explain that this didn't come around to this till the late 18th century so for the 19th century for 1800 years the church was not even talking about a rapture okay they weren't even talking about these kinds of ideas the the word rapture is not in the book of revelation and there's really only one place where it shows up, and that's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. But it is not referring to the Lord coming back and taking Christians off to escape tribulation. Now, you'll read in your book about escapist kind of theology, and that's what that is. Now, um, if you examine that passage as some really responsible scholars have done, you will see that the verbs that are used there depict like what people would do when a dignitary was coming to town, like a king or some, some member of royalty, some person of notoriety. The people would go out to meet this person and then they would escort them back into town. And before all that happened, they prepared the way. Like they would go out, and if there were big old, you know, humps in the road, they'd level those out. If there were potholes, they'd fill those up. They wanted to make it just as smooth as possible. So this idea of meeting the Lord in the air, Paul didn't say anything about jetting off somewhere after that the idea is that we meet the lord in the air to welcome him back to earth and when you follow the scripture in the new testament you realize that the new earth and the new heaven that's here and so that that's another part of this idea. You you got to you got to get your your brain working in a proper fashion that matches what the scripture says, not what people want it to say. Now, here's another idea that leads people astray. You've seen the movies where the Lord is supposed to come back and take all the Christians away. 
Have you seen some of those? Uh, I remember seeing the the um, advertisements where somebody's shoes are empty and there's smoke there, and they've they've you know they're gone, or the the plane is being piloted by a Christian, and all of a sudden the plane is pilotless, and cars are crashing, and all this you know uh, conflagration is is erupting, and everything's in disarray. Because the Lord has come and taken the Christians out of the fray. Well, if you read Matthew 24, you will find that what Jesus parallels his second coming with is the days of Noah. And what happened when the flood hit? What does Jesus say? In those days... People were marrying, and they were living, and they were partying, and they were going about life just as normal. But then the flood came and swept them away. Now, who were the only ones who were not swept away? It was Noah and his family. They were safe within the ark. And so what Jesus is saying here is that when he comes back, that's going to be a time of judgment. Christians aren't being swept away anywhere. Christians will be left behind. Okay? Now, that's that's a very easily demonstrated fact from passages in the new testament and matthew 24 is case in point it's very clear so um these ideas of the lord is going to come back take the church out and then there's going to be this seven year period of tribulation well that that is it doesn't matter if you go to daniel and start counting up weeks or wherever you go to Ezekiel and then in Revelation, there's nothing in there that supports that kind of an idea. Now, why would I say that? Well, it's because in the New Testament, we are told over and over and over again, not just by Jesus, but by Paul, but by John, but by Peter, by James, They all refer to the Christian life being a time that is difficult and going through persecution. Paul said at the end of the first missionary journey, it is necessary for you to go through tribulation and trials on our way to the kingdom. So when we start thinking about there's a time coming that God is going to rescue us from, that does not match what the New Testament teaches about Christian life. Now, if you want to talk about a time where we will be rescued from, that's at the end. Whenever the Lord returns, that is going to happen, not because he's taken us away and then we're going to come back later. It's because when Jesus comes back, then the judgment And then the parceling of people going to one place or another for eternity, and then we will forever be with the Lord. So, um, so I've I've cast these things out here for you. I I want you to, to think about as we go through this lesson, this, this book, Read very carefully. Uh, did, did you get the introduction already? Did you read through that? Now, not, well, I'm not telling you anything that's not in there. There are some misconceptions that people have just latched onto because that's just all they've ever heard. I remember being scared to death uh, about these kinds of things. Why should I be afraid? of the Lord returning to this earth. I shouldn't be. There's nothing to fear. 
In fact, that's going to be a gloriously wonderful day. Yes, I know that it's going to accompany judgment and the bad or um, the awful termination and awful ending or conclusion of people's lives who have decided not to follow the Lord. That is a reality. So um, I, I want to think biblically about anything that I'm reading in the Bible. Now, that sounds like a silly statement, but I need to think biblically about various ideas like heaven, hell, uh, the Christian life, discipleship. What do you think the author means uh, by his subtitle for the, the title of this book? Revelation for the rest of us, a prophetic call to follow Jesus as a dissident disciple. What does that, what does that mean? What did you take that to mean? What is a prophetic call? Now that, when you see that word, don't think prediction. Think the expounding upon theology. Think about a, a clarion call from God to be a dissident disciple. In other words, to be one who resists evil. And wherever the spirit of Antichrist shows up. Now, what do we have in the book of Revelation? We have talk of the beast. Now, let me, let me, let me give you just a little introduction to what that probably was referring to. Now, the, we don't know for sure about a lot of things, Okay. But I, I, I've read a certain author, and his name is, uh, this is a great name, Ethelbert Stauffer. Where, where have you ever seen a name similar to that? Stouffer's Frozen Foods, you know, a little food thing pop in the microwave? Isn't that Stouffer? That's not Stauffer, but it's close. Ethelbert Stauffer, he has a book entitled Christ and the Caesars. Now, Ethelbert Stauffer was, was a genius when it came to exploring historical background and, and context of the Scripture. And that's, that's a crucial, crucial thing to do. You have to study the Word with respect to when it was written, why it was written, who wrote it, who received it, and then you can and understand what it meant then before you can ever understand what it means now. Okay? Now, Ethelbert Stauffer um, thinks, and, I, and I, I believe he's right, that the beast was Domitian. Now, there, there is... Um, an extra biblical story that means outside of the Bible about the Apostle John. Now he was going around in Asia Minor at the time and, and it was around where all of these churches that are mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3 and um, he was preaching that you know Domitian is you know he, he's not God. All of the emperors thought they were God. They, they, they uh, uh, proclaim for themselves all of the superlatives that we only rightfully should tag onto Jesus. You know, they, they are not the omnipotent ones. They are not the omniscient ones. They are not the ones that are all-powerful and all-knowing and worthy of everybody's worship. 
and obedience. So Domitian told him, so you, you know, you're going to have to stop doing that or, you know, we're going to have to get rid of you. Well, Domitian didn't listen to that. He kept on preaching. And finally, Domitian decided, well, we're just going to we're just going to put you into a vat of boiling oil. And so they got John and they dipped him down in that like a French fry at McDonald's and kept him there for a while. And they pulled him out and he says, well, I'm pretty much good. It didn't even affect him. It was just like Daniel in the lion's den or three friends who were in the fiery furnace. They, their hairs weren't even singed. So what do you do with somebody you can't kill? Well, you exile them. And so Domitian exiled John to the island of Patmos. And while he's there, Jesus appears to him and says, hey, what do you say we have a little fun with Domitian? And so when you read the book of Revelation, read it as a political satire. It is a political type of a book in the sense that Christians are to resist anti-Christian governments, no matter what they are. And in this case, it was in Rome. And during that time, let me tell you, there is, there is nothing that the Lord is going to come here to pull us out of or away from that is worse than things that have already happened to martyrs through all of these centuries. You need to read Fox's Book of Martyrs sometime. And just, just it'll, it'll curl your hair and your ears just to find out what they did to these people. And if you ever translated the Scripture into the language that people could read, well, they just decided, decided to burn you to death or strangle you and then bury you. And then, you know, a pope comes along later decides, hey, let's dig up his bones and let's just go ahead and pulverize those and let's throw those into the river. So there, there, there's nothing that is going to be like in a series of years that we are going to be protected from that is known as the tribulation. The tribulation is going on right now. Now, do you realize in the last... I think it's a hundred years more people have been martyred in, in the combination of all the years before, back to the beginning of the church. So martyrdom has increased exponentially. It, it's astounding to realize the numbers that are current. So people are dying for the Lord right and left. We're, we're sort of insulated from this because, you know, we're not sitting here thinking somebody's going to bust through the doors and mow us all down. Now, it could be some other, I mean, we've got guns. Every, you know, you know, realize other countries are, are warning their citizens about traveling to the United States. It used to be the other way around. And really, I felt safer in Pakistan and Mozambique than I did in San Antonio or in Jackson now. So this, this whole idea of, of the beast. Now, get this. Where did the 666 come from? By the way, there is a, a, there is a Greek manuscript that's an alternative text that reads 616, but we won't get into all that but it helps us to understand that this is not just some pull it out of the air idea whenever a king uh, would um, come into his tenure in rome they would mint coins to commemorate the beginning of his reign and so there was particular coin that commemorated Domitian. And what they would do is on the, on the perimeter of that coin, they would have 
like the first letter, and these would have been, uh, you know, Roman letters, Latin letters, that was the beginning of, remember all of these superlatives I was talking about before, like omnipotent one or whatever? They'd have those around there, and if you take those letters and assign their numerical value and add them up, it's 666. Now, you could Google that and, and find that, and it's, it's readily available to read of. Now, that makes a whole lot more sense to me than someone having a 666, you know, put in their head. Now, what did it mean for someone to have the mark of the beast? Well, it makes a whole lot more sense that if unless you had money, then you can't buy bread. If Christians don't have money, they can't eat. And they might not have money because they don't bow down to Domitian. So that, that's just a, a little, you know, a couple stories from that book that emerge from historical context. Now, here's another little thing as far as introduction goes. Let's just think about how we read the book of Revelation. Now, I know that all of you have probably read it once, twice, maybe more than that. But if, if you are a futurist, you probably read that word as, as far as one of the viewpoints. If you're a dispensationalist, you probably think that the first three chapters of the book of Revelation are devoted to the past, to the time of the book of Revelation. And then chapters 4 through 22, that's all for the future. Now, can, can anybody tell me why that is a problematic viewpoint? let's say that you were a first century let the end of the first century it's it's uh, ad 86 ad 90 and your church let's say that that this was a uh, laodicea and we re we received this letter from john well ev even just the letters to the churches but it's it's the whole thing okay what would you think about if you received that letter in A.D. 90. Would you be thinking, when you get to the end of chapter 3, well, everything else after that's just for the 21st century. You probably wouldn't be thinking that. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense for us to think that a book like Revelation could in any way just be significant for them with the first three chapters and four through 22 is for us that is a mischaracterization of the whole combination of the book's genre now genre is the kind of literature that it is Revelation is a, is, is a combination of three. It's a letter. It is um, apocalyptic. Now, that's not eucalyptic. That's a cough drop. But apocalyptic, what did you read in, in your... Um, if you look in your book, let's go down to... Um, look at... Uh, ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba -da, here we go. Appendix 2. Go all the way to page, I think it's 255 in your book. Is, there, is there that appendix two, what's an apocalypse? Do you all see that? Appendix two. Okay, is everybody there? Well, if you look at this, um, to many writers... Too many writers reduce apocalyptic literature to simplicities or to fanaticisms. 
reduction is fine as long as it's accurate. Reduction is fine as long as it's accurate, but most reduction we have seen and heard are not accurate. Instead of reduction, the best thing to do is rely on experts. In the 1970s to 80s, an academic group in the Society of Biblical Literature, by the way, that's the meeting, I'm going to that same group's meeting in November, Society of Biblical Literature, led by J.J. Collins, composed a complex set of characteristics of this kind of literature. Well, first off, it's a genre of revelatory literature. In other words, it's, it's like the curtain is coming up and something's being unveiled. Something's being uncovered. Okay, that revelation means an unveiling. It is also, it has a narrative framework in which a revelation is mediated by an otherworldly being to a human recipient. And who, who do we have in the book of Revelation for that? Jesus is communicating this to John. It discloses a transcendent reality that is both temporal insofar as it envisages or sees eschatological salvation. Now, if you were to replace eschatological, it's a big word, with end time salvation, what do you think that means? What is end time salvation? It's eventually where we're going to be. That's at the end, okay? The very simple message of the book of Revelation is God wins. Revelation is the um, ultimate conquering of good over evil. That's what Revelation is about. And that day is going to come. And you see, that's a, that's a big part of the message for Christian disciples to persevere in the face of persecution. Like when Domitian was the emperor, or whether it was Nero, or whoever it was, Christians were dying regularly. Horrible kinds of deaths. So what, what would you have to do? What, why is this, what is part of the message? You need to hang in there. You need to persevere. And we, we're going to look at these, these letters that start or are at the foreword of the book of Revelation. These are letters to seven churches that really did exist. Just like this. Now, it was probably a house church, and there might have been several of them connected with each other, but the Lord had a message for each one of them, and they all follow the same kind of a pattern, and the Lord praises them. If there's anything good on the premises, he points it out, but he also has some, some words of um, instruction and some words of, that are along the discipline line, like for Laodicea, you have lost, no, no, that's the, the first one, you have lost your first love. You need to return to it. Now, when you get, when you get to see the, the oil painting, it's, it's, really, it's really pretty graphic because you, you got the church is really small. It's right down here in this corner. And up here you've got, it's not clearly made out, but it's just with these etched lines. There's a, it's like a cross. And it's leaning toward the church. It's not as if the Lord no longer is in love with these people. He's not abandoned them. They have moved away from him. They're still in the picture 
and they can repent and they can return to the Lord. Let's let's read that real quick. So take your your Bible and we'll go to Revelation and let's just look at a couple of these. It's it's that book right before maps. <laughs> the letter to Ephesus. Um, write to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Thus says the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil people. You have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be liars. Now, let me just say something right there about that. You, know, you, you, you hear a lot of, oh, you know, don't be too hard on people. Don't say anything ugly to them. You know, don't judge them. Do, do you know that one of the chief functions of a prophet in a church, of the people in a church, is to make sure to test the spirits to see if they are from God. John tells us that, 1 John. You have to be able to sniff out false prophecy. When I say false prophecy, I'm talking about those who say they're preaching the word of God, but they are not. Now, this is why it's important one of the reasons why it's so important not to abuse the interpretation of this book. Because if you go around teaching that, oh man, the Lord, he's, he's going to come back by, you know, now he, they could be saying 2024, or I don't know what the next time is, but you, you've been around long enough to remember these. The first one I ever saw was 1988. I was sitting in my office in Abbott, Texas, hometown of Willie Nelson. I'm not connecting him with this happening, but uh, but I got a book in the mail one day, 88 Reasons Why the Lord is Going to come, come Back in 88. And it was already 88. So I just put it in the trash. Because why would I do that? Is that being ugly? Oh, you're not giving the guy a chance. No. I know what the Bible says. The Lord says, you don't know when. I, I don't even know. And if Jesus says that he didn't know, how we expect some jack leg to know? He's just trying to make money with books. And that's one of the reasons they do that. It gets people all lathered up. Oh, man, the Lord's going to come back in, in 1988. Man, we've got to get ready. Well, this has happened in, in history. I think I have said in a sermon before about what happened in 999. You all remember that? Pope Sylvester? Who thinks of Sylvester the Cat and Twinny Bird when I said that? I don't know why. I, I, that's just how my brain works. <laughs> Are you surprised, Miss Bunn? Okay, well, it's very good. Uh, but, you know, he was preaching that, hey, yeah, we don't worry about making any plans. This is all going to be over. As soon as it turns 1,000, the Lord's coming. They'll let criminals go. They'll let animals run free. They ran up huge debts. They took no more interest in maintaining their lives. Christian discipleship, don't worry about it. Just get ready. Can you imagine going through that year thinking that? 
How, how would you like to go to church every week and, and think that? I mean, if people get really, you know, it, it would save a lot of time for making, you know, you wouldn't have to have any five-year plan, right? You just, you just have a one-year, let's pray for, let's pray for Christmas, and then, then it's all over with, January the 1st. Well, whatever timekeeping mechanism they had, they didn't have clocks, but something was making a sound for midnight, and it stopped. And the text I was reading it said, not a few people died of fright. I mean, they were just scared to death. I mean, the, the clock stopped. Hey, wait a second. You're too early. You got eight more, you know, bongs or whatever. Well, the clock restarted or whatever. And, well, it's 2013. Now, I will say that you would be surprised that at least one of the Wesley brothers had made a prediction. And we've had some Baptists do the same thing. You might be surprised at some of the names on that list. But my friends, what can, can we decide together tonight? We're that we're going not that you haven't already decided, but can we just put that to bed? Let let I it, it, you know if I hear about you coming up with a prognostication, I, I'm gonna come wherever you are, and we're gonna have a talk. All right, it's gonna be nose to nose. And we're going we're gonna to think back about this day, okay? <laughs> Can you imagine the, the, the harm that you're going to do to people who don't know better? It, it's just going to put their lives in total disarray. So let's believe what Jesus said. And that'd be good enough for me. I think we got a song. We, we sing that. Look what else he says. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet you do have this. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches to the one who conquers, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, when you read through all of these, you're going to find out that Satan comes up in three or four of these churches' descriptions. Look at the very next, uh, the, um, 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 the next one, Smyrna. Write to the angel of the church in Smyrna. Thus says the first and the last, the one who was dead and came to life. I know your affliction and poverty, but you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Wow. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. You know, he, he didn't say to him, well, hey, if you can hang on till the tribulation, hang on till the rapture, you'll be all right. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you. How do you like to hear that on a Wednesday night? Like, you know, that's, that's part of the announcements. <laughs> then it would quickly become one of the prayer requests, right? <laughs> we got a dual action notice. <laughs> um, and you will experience affliction for 10 days. Now, that probably is 10 real days. Um, be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So you, you, you have this, there are seven of these, and every one of them is different. Now, one of the things that some people have done throughout the history of the church is to say that there are seven dispensations in world history. And uh, you'll find this in the Schofield Reference Bible. And I think they make the creation of the world in 6004 B.C. Or is it 4006? I always get that mixed up. That, and, and by the way, it's in the, it's in the column. Okay? It's not part of the text. Okay? That's not inspired. But they say that 
if each one of these churches represents a church dispensation of a thousand years, that, uh, there's no way in the world that you can get that from reading this. These are real churches. Now, it could be that, here's how you can apply it. How about say, okay, which one of these churches do we resemble? What are, what are we known for? Is it describing us? That would be a way uh, to apply it. So, um, so what I'm saying to you is w- we have to make sure that we understand what kind of literature this is. It's a letter. It's apocalyptic. You can read about apocalyptic. It's also prophetic. And prophetic means most of the time in Scripture, it is foretelling rather than foretelling. There is some foretelling, but you would be surprised how little there is of messianic prophecy in the Old Testament. It's less than 1% of all prophetic utterances in the Old Testament prophets. They also were preaching to the people of their time. Now, there are some places like Isaiah 7, 14, where it's very clear that he's talking about the coming of Jesus, and Matthew picks up on that in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. So, um, if I'm looking at the book of Revelation three genre all mixed up together now here here here's the thing you got to think about and i think we might get be close to how long are we supposed to go till nine (laughs) he's always wanting to (laughs) he's sitting up uh, start making the smoke signals that okay it's time um what you have to do is recognize what you're reading Now, if I'm reading history, like a historical book, numbers, I'm going to read that differently from the way that I read the book of Psalms. I don't read poetry the same way I read history. What is in poetic language that's different from history? Sorry? Yeah, a lot of symbolism. Bert, when you used to write poems to your wife all the time, you know, you you remember that? <laughs> I don't remember me. <laughs> uh, and, and you're going to read uh, a gospel story, the biography of Jesus, different from reading what? The book of Revelation. Or the book of Daniel, or a, a prophecy, which as soon as we hear prophecy, what do we would normally think? You're projecting out in the future. That's a bad habit, okay? That's a bad habit. And we're going to keep talking about that and give you more and more illustrations of why that's misleading, okay? So, um, liken this to trying to learn the the rules to play a game okay how how many of you have ever well what what i would do before i intro to bible study class i would bring this game it's called uh, stratego you ever hear that game stratego well it's a game it's evolved some they got a different like monopoly you can find all kinds of monopoly games um but stratego you have red pieces and blue pieces, and you've got, you're supposed to capture the flag. That's, that's the idea. You move your pieces certain ways, and there's certain ways you move just like chess. You know, they're different things. And so what I'll do is say, okay, how many of you have never played this game? And they'll raise their hand, so I'll pick two of them and say, all right, come up here and explain it to us. And so, so they come up, and I don't do anything. They open it up. 
They put the board down, and they got to figure out what to do. And, you know, they can, they see it. there's red and blue pieces, so they, you know, they divide those. And, but they don't know what it means that an eight is a minor and a nine is a scout, and there's a spy, and there's a marshal, and there's three colonels and majors. Well, they can see there's a ranking system, and there are bombs, and there's a flag. So what you're supposed to do is protect your flag, and the only thing that can take out a bomb is a minor. Anything else hits the bomb, it blows up. So uh, they, they fiddle around with it, and they just say, well, we, just, we don't know how to play this game. So and there's normally somebody who always can play it. And I said, well, come up here and, exp- and explain it to us. And they, will, they go through the whole thing, and they know exactly how to set it up. They know how to play the game. So just like you're not going to go mountain climbing with scuba diving equipment on. Can you imagine going up the side of the mountain with the, the flippers on? It's just not made for that. So I've got to recognize what I'm reading. If it's poetry, if it's history, if it's a parable, if it's apocalyptic literature, if it's a letter, I have to know what I'm reading. So you read it that way. Now, here, here's this big assignment now. You ready for this? I want you sometime during the week, between now and next, well, now we, are we going to, did we decide about that? About next Wednesday? Okay. Um, I want you to read it in one sitting. All 22 chapters. Now that, listen, that's harder for me than you realize because office hours at Union, that was my kryptonite, all right? It was hard for me to sit behind a desk for very long. But you will get something out of that. If you'll do that, you'll start to note. Well, I'm not going to tell you what you're going to notice. I want you to write it down. If you see something is repeating or if there, something is similar or whatever, see what you get out of the whole thing. That's especially true when you're doing reading a letter of Paul's. Why would you read just part of a letter? Makes sense to read the whole letter, right? Now, some of them are shorter than others. Philemon, that won't take you very long to read that. When we start talking about 1 Corinthians, that's 16 chapters. But really, you know what messes us up? Chapter verse divisions. Have you ever seen a Bible without those? They have them. What do you think the benefit could be of reading a Bible with no divisions in it? Hmm? Yeah, it's, there's, you know, because right now, I mean, it's a good thing to have that because, you you know, here in turn chapter 2, verse 6. But if you learn the story... You don't need that. You know where it is. You find it. And this way you're not going to break it up and decide, I'm going to cherry pick a few verses here and there. Then we're going to get some from over here in Daniel. Then we're going to get some over here, Ezekiel and 3 John. Then we're going to put them all together. And we're going to make us a really cool, you know, biblical smoothie. And it's going to taste good. But guess what? It's, It's probably rotten. Because the things you put in there, they don't go together. So, um, you got to read things in context. You need to read things holistically so you can get the ultimate impact of that work. Have you ever picked up a book you just couldn't put down? (laughs) I I, I got to find out what happens, you know. Timmy is caught in a cave, and, you know, Lassie hadn't gotten to the police yet. We got, what's going to happen? Uh, so once you start doing that and you get in the groove on that, it, it will become richer for you to read the Bible because you realize that there's all of these fantastic stories 
and you'll start to see how it all fits together to make the one big story that I've been telling you about for ever since I've been here. And the best part of the story is at the end of the book of Revelation. You would not believe how many parallels there are between Genesis 1, 2, and 3 and Revelation 20, 21, and 22. There are like 45 comparisons. And remember what I told you before? Where do we start? In the garden. Where do we end? In the garden. Paradise lost, paradise regained. Those are the bookends of the whole story. And let me tell you, the end of this story is muy bueno, right? God wins. Ultimately will be the victor over evil. So, any questions? And I and I'll give you I'll give you guys time to talk too. I don't going to be up here just talking all the time. Um my wife would probably say, "Yeah, right." Uh, <laughs> So you have any questions tonight? While you're reading, write them down. And uh, so read Revelation, and I want you to think about what you've always thought about Revelation. Is it one of those books that you'd like to just forget about? I don't want to mess with that. too hard to understand. You know, a lot of preachers will not preach from Revelation anymore used to that's all they do i guess they found out man we've been wrong about this so much maybe we just ought to just stick with second chronicles or whatever okay y'all are a great crowd but it's uh eight o'clock i think and uh if you want to stay in 30 minutes i'm, I'm no <laughs> the lord may come back you know what